we're doing a general panel discussion on it for the three of us up here. And Mike, if this becomes fun with the mic, let us know. <laughs> um, but uh, before we get into that, though, I kind of want to emphasize kind of what I like to call the money slide. And I, I don't have the slide up here, and I could switch out, but it'll take longer than it'll take to explain it. Just to show you what the opportunity is around what we're trying to talk about tonight around free market healthcare options. If you were to go off and take a typical person around uh, like a type two diabetic around 58 years old, if you were to go at healthcare.gov and get a gold plan, you would pay about a $13,000 a year premium payment for it and you pay out of pocket for your, for your condition around $1,000. So you're totaling in around $14,000 and that is the high echelon healthcare.gov, I don't want any worry bead type coverage, right? Let's take a step down and experiment a little bit with some of the plans that are available at healthcare.gov. Maybe I'll go down to a bronze plan. So the premiums drop down to about $6,000 per year, but the cost sharing goes up a bit. So now I'm paying about $4,000 out of pocket in addition to the principal. I've still saved money over that gold plan because I've gone from $14,000 down to $10,000 a year. Well, what if I take the next step and I actually I call up Paul and I said, hey, let's take a direct primary care service agreement on top of um, the uh, bronze plan premium. So I'm going to still pay the $6,000 premium, but instead of all these out-of-pocket costs with the cost-sharing provisions associated with that bronze coverage, I'm going to pay him maybe about $1,000 a year or so. Say, so now you've gone from $14,000 down to $7,000 by going to a bronze plan plus DPCS. If I take that next step and get into a healthcare ministry program, and I couple that with a direct primary care service, now I'm starting to talk about a $3,500. So now we've gone off and say from 14, and this is real data, by the way, this is a real numbers have gone off, and actually Chad's added a few other breakouts on it in the last presentation for different demographics. We've gone from $14,000 a year down to $3,500 a year just by starting to adopt some of the solutions here that are offered by Victoria and by, by Paul. That, that's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we're all bleary-eyed driving across the state <laughs> telling people what's available because this is big time. This helps change people's lives in a very, very real way. So I hope you found it valuable and uh, we can open it up to, to overall questions, but I wanted to make sure you left with that. When I start talking about 20% savings, I'm lowballing. I'm, I'm seriously, that's tracing back to one study I can go off and put up there. But I know from practical experience working with these docs, working with organizations like Kira, that we actually can get significantly higher savings on it. And the, remember that the way you get these savings is by getting people better care. And to your point, sir, you keep them out of the hospital, you keep them out of the chronic illnesses, and um, that's where the money comes from. So maybe open it up for a few more questions, and then we'll just break into one-on-ones if that's all right. Yes, sir. Short editorial comment. Yeah. We have just seen a demonstration of free enterprise. You let people free to think up, come up with all these crazy ideas, and you can come up with something good, as opposed to single payer under socialism and communism. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Congressman Bob McEwen used to say, uh, try f freedom, it only works every time it's tried. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of questions over here. One problem I see with your model is that as long as as long as we're dealing with existing health plans, they all have those preventative services, which are which are the things that you would provide, and those preventative services are at no cost, even though like I'm paying fourteen hundred dollars a month for my Blue Cross. Um, but I don't have to pay when I go to the doctor for my annual physical. So, you know, so I, so I see the value in what Congress, some Congress, some members of Congress said we got to get rid of the preventative services. If we did, and there were options available without those, then all of a sudden your plan becomes very attractive. Right. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem, right? We need to have more people engaging in direct primary care who are demanding those sort of catastrophic coverage plans that only provide for the hospital care, perhaps some specialist care, and you know, the heart attack strokes, 
you know, those kind of emergency services, right? That'd be ideal, and then you would pair that with mine. But currently, there is no demand because there are only a handful of direct primary care doctors in the state of Michigan. So what we're doing out here is getting out to, to our communities and saying, if you want to save money on health care, you have to vote with your pocketbook and choose direct primary care and choose the services that we're providing. I, it may not save you money this year, but it's certainly going to save you time. And time is money. Like if you're waiting, so I, I had somebody who made an appointment with me today for the first time because he said, I know I have bronchitis and I can't get in to see my doctor until Friday. Okay, I've got 10 o'clock available, I got 2 o'clock available, and I have 4 o'clock available when you want to come in. 10 o'clock, great, see you at 10. He came in, we took care of the issue within two hours of him texting me, okay? That's how I save you time, and indirectly that's gonna save you some money over the long term. It's not gonna save you from the big expenses, because you're right, those expenses are already baked into your insurance plan, unfortunately. Well, actually, I've got a little bit different perspective on it. I mean, it builds on what he's talking about, but you heard the savings we're talking about, right? Oh, yeah. So, you may pay a little bit of a premium. I mean, I'm an engineer. I realize most engines aren't 100% efficient. <laughs> um, so I may pay a little bit extra, if, even though they are, they've got some of the primary care costs baked into the traditional insurance plan. But for the savings that we're looking at for this, and considering the fact that most of the time for the primary care, you're still paying a copay, you're still paying a per visit fee. Um, yeah, it may, no with us. you may, it may not be optimal, but it's still probably at the end of the year is going to be a better deal. Yeah. And then, is there a chance hey, that the kind of plans that Curio has, is there a chance that they will, that Congress would open that up to non non ministry, non religious? Like, why couldn't I, I'm a lawyer? Yeah. Why couldn't there be a group for lawyers that all over the state oh. or all over the country, you know, yeah. where they do the same thing? Or why couldn't there be a group for people over 65 that want to just do it instead of Medicare? Well, you have to thank the Affordable Care Act for that. They've chosen the five, but like Hero, how we were founded mm -hmm. after that, if there is a group and one of those five do decide that yes, they can sponsor you or umbrella you, you can do that. That's what we did. You know, we were founded in 2011, so we went under the you know, pr you know, the partnership with Samaritan. They're the ones that fit best with what we believe in and what we wanted to accomplish. So you can do that, you know, if you wanted to and if you were able to find that. Just one right now, unless you know the law changes, one of those five would have to be willing to obviously have that partnership with that group. Um, actually, the one behind you. I don't see a problem with the plan. When I grew up, my father was construction, so we had a doctor who did exactly what you do right now. We would go to his office, he would do the entire examination, he would go to his closet, get the medicine, he would go take it in the back room for x-rays. And that was in the 60s and 70s. And he lived to be 100, and he's not here anymore, so, <laughs> you know, that's not the bargain. I think that the whole, I don't even want the Affordable Care Act at this point, because I know what you're really paying for. I want all that stuff, and when they say that they really desire direct <coughs> physicians like yourself, this is what I would put in place. You. Well, thank you. And then, they would put a, <laughs> then I would put a catastrophic program in place. I'm not really into making insurance companies wealthy. Right, right. In law school, you used to say that's why they call them the big hands people because they have all the money. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's life insurance. And all the <laughs> yeah, it's like the more the more money that passes through their hands, the more that it sticks to it. But kind of the the what you're bringing up is this this ain't a new concept, right? No. no. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's what's old is new again, and I think we're going through a cycle of saying. This whole insurance thing, this big insurance thing, isn't really working for everyday Americans. Can we go back to something where we have direct relationships with our doctors again, right? And we're not moving back in our medical care, though. We still have all the progress. We all have our technology. We all have the 21st century uh, medical amenities that we've grown with. It's just we're bringing back that personal relationship that we should have with our doctors. And to kind of emphasize this, I didn't talk about this, but it kind of highlights exactly what you just said. See that chart in the back there? 
That's not a colorblindness test. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually a functional diagram of the Affordable Care Act. And to your point, and to Paul's point about what's happened under, and it was bad before the Affordable Care Act, so I don't want to give the impression it was a panacea, but the Affordable Care Act added 159 new organizations between a physician and the patient. Each one of those hand. And, uh, you know, I would submit that those 159 new organizations in D.C. getting D.C. salaries are not lowering the cost of health care and uh, they're not improving the quality because those, the bureaucrats in D.C. ain't going to know more than Paul does about what makes you tick and what's going to make you tick again, right? So I, it's got to get back to that personal relationship. And everybody, there's a buzzword now, patient-centered care and all this kind of stuff, and I even use it in my first solution for Medicaid. But that's not patient-centered. <laughs> that, that's bureaucracy-centered, and that's control. It has nothing to do with care. Now, yes, sir. as I recollect, the big, the big dot in the middle is, uh, what's that, governors from Alaska's death panels? No, no, that's the iPad. That's the Independent Patient Advisory Board, which was actually put in place under the stimulus bill. <laughs> no, 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 that's actually, in this case, now under President Trump, that's actually a good guy. That's, that, <laughs> so, you remember that story of saying you, you live by the pen and the phone, you die by the pen and the phone? Well, all the regulatory authority that was given to Kathleen Sebelius when she was first in there is now in the hands of Dr. Tom Price. And I'm... <laughs> And Dr. Tom Price is one of the co-founders of an organization called Docs for Patient Care, which was formed back in 2009 to fight Obamacare. So that's poetic now. I'm happy to say I actually worked with the Trump transition team to actually provide a list of free market advocates all the way through health and human services. So the uh, FDA, the CDC, CMS, and Dr. Tom Price at the top of our list for HHS secretaries, and that's who President Trump picked. So we're, we've got much more latitude there. Frankly, the problem right now is dealing with Congress and getting them out of their rut. And as soon as we get them going, we've got some very good allies now in HHS, and it gives me, it warms my heart. So, Jeff, go ahead. Um, I was thinking about small businesses. You know, a lot of us here may be represented by big companies, we have our insurance through yeah. work. Yeah. But small businesses, um, we have a daughter that works for an insurance broker. And some of these small businesses have become desperate. They, mm -hmm. they provided health insurance for their employees, but as this has gone on, the employees have had to pay more, and in a lot of cases, they've had to drop in health insurance yeah. for their employees. And I see that as a kind of a market for something like what you are all talking about. We actually do accommodate. So even though we're Catholic based, we accept all Christians. Um, so we do have like religious orders, communities who do have us as their insurance, but we do have small businesses. We actually have a college, Ohio Valley University. So we do offer it to small businesses and even large businesses, you know. So we do have that. Um, so just to answer that question, like, you know, for those type of people and, you know, communities, we do offer a program for that. So that way, it, you know, employers can now say, okay, if you want, you can now have this as your insurance option, which obviously as an employer is going to save them thousands of dollars a year. But then also it's going to help their employee, you know, with their health care to choose their doctor to create that relationship, but then also to help them with their needs. Yeah, so um, like our, our, my margins are so small that I wouldn't be able to kick any money back to that broker. So likely they're not going to refer to me. But kind of to your point about small businesses, if you're a small business and you're over 50 full-time equivalents, you are mandated by the federal government to provide health insurance. But if you're under 50 full-time equivalents, um, a lot of these companies can't afford to provide that health insurance, quote unquote. I argue why not offer them health care and I do offer group discounts for those small businesses and I have a few small businesses enrolled in my 
platform. I don't know if you have any other qu comments on this. Well, point. actually, I do want to highlight because usually we talk about self-funded insurance plans, and there's something else called MIWAS, which is multi-employer. I forget what was, whatever. <laughs> multi-employer plans as well on it. That's when you talk about self-funded insurance. That is ideally suited to the small, mid-sized businesses. And uh, what that does is instead of you paying a premium to a third-party insurance company, you actually are the one who pay the claims yourself. And therefore, if you undershoot on the claims, you benefit. You can go off and pocket it, put it aside, give it back to the employees. Um, and then if you're on the high end, if you actually exceed your projected claims, most companies will produce, pur purchase a stop loss on it, just like for stocks. You put a stop loss on it so you're limited on your exposure on the high end. So there are plans for small, mid-size. Almost 83%, I think, of large companies actually self-fund, and, and that way they, they benefit from that as well. That way you'll, if you see folks like Toyota doing their jumping jacks every single day, they have a way of getting everybody in good health so that they can lower those overall claims rates. And you can do the same thing for small, mid-sized businesses with a self-funded plan under ERISA. That was one of our exemptions. Um, and then, and then if you pair one of those plans with direct primary care services, and we can save your entire company 20%, then you're really earning money for your company by you know pocketing that 20% or giving it back to your employees as salary, so you can retain that top talent and you know grow your business. And that's actually what one of our doctors that sometimes does our tour. He started a business called Salta Direct, and he's targeting employers around 500, 700 employees and doing that. Sorry, John. Go ahead. Okay. So, so what is the path forward? How do you incentivize uh, more physicians to adopt this model? And is there any legislation you're contemplating that would um, Allow you to, I'll do the uh, legislation first. Gaps that uh, are not addressed by um, you know, this model. All right. Well, one concept around free market is that government doesn't mandate it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so, so right here. Well, I'm the only the only exception is that as as somebody who works for the government, I'm promoting it. So, <laughs> I. Um, but what we really want to do is use government services like Medicaid to prime the pump on the footprint and expanding the footprint of direct primary care providers. Once people realize, no, this is for real, it's stable, it's good, and it works for people, 2.4 million people represents 25% of the people in Michigan. That's a pretty good market share, right? That's a pretty good footprint, if you will. You're going to have, in order to support that population, you got to be everywhere throughout the state. So one of the things, things that I'm doing is this, and why I'm so excited about this DPCS Medicaid pilot, even though we're only starting out with 2,400 enrollees on it, um, it's proven it, and it's, gener it's priming the pump on the demand. If you, if docs like Paul know that there's 2.4 million customers just being held back by the dam right now that we're just gonna wait to unleash, that's huge. And when they unleash it for them, it opens it up for the private market as well. So that's the big thing that I'm trying to do. The other legislation we already passed, it's around that, that as Paul was talking about, it's PA 522-2014. So really it's just evangelism mode and, pro and protecting us from, protecting this model from insurance companies coming in and trying to play games with the model right now. Yeah, I guess the second piece for that for doctors is that, I, you know, family medicine doctors make a reasonable amount of money. They make good money being family med docs. So for them to give that up and potentially earn nothing or put in money into a business that may or may not succeed, that's really the barrier. And so that's why Senator Kolbeck's talking about kind of priming the pump. Because it took a great risk for me to give up a paycheck with a hospital system to build a company from the ground up and try to start delivering care just because you know it, feel, it feels right with my soul to spend an hour with my patients and not see them in five minutes or try to save them money rather than overcharging them. You know, there's no guarantee that the free market would reward me. Now, so far I've been blessed in that it has been rewarding me and that people are enjoying the service and paying for the service in, through Plum Health. But for other doctors, it's not a guarantee. I've had to learn uh, several like marketing business type skills that I didn't have going through medical school. Right, so I think that's what's holding other docs back. <coughs> this I, is my last question. <laughs> that's okay. My last comment also. <laughs> How many times have you been asked 
Have you tossed your hat, or are you tossing your hat in the ring for governor? In the ring for governor. Um, I'll, I'll leave this. Well, let me. Uh, <laughs> Paul, how many times have you been asked? I have, I have not been asked yet. Thankfully, I, you know, I'm trying to do medical care. Well, he's right. Maybe he's talking to Victoria. Victoria, how many times have you been asked? So I, this is a Senate event, so I better not talk about any of that stuff here. But it is uh, it is a question I've been asked a lot in Courage. So um, so. But that's about all I can say in this venue right now. But uh, we'll uh, stay tuned. We got uh, if you follow us on uh, social media and Facebook, uh, we try to get out announcements about what's going on there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yep. I'll get you. Yeah. One problem I'm running into here is that I assume, assume for example, that I'm a millennial, Bernie Sanders supporter sitting here listening to this. Yeah. And I come up with, listen, all I've heard here, all I've heard here is a bunch of BS. I like the fact that there are people right now who are getting care who were who were not getting care before. And who are getting care now for Medicare. And they have pre existing conditions. I don't hear you guys addressing any of this. As far as I'm concerned, I'm still supporting Bernie Sanders and his ideas. Yeah. Here's what we're running into, because a lot of people out there right now, they're not really bothered about this issue because they're not paying the insurance premium. They're employers. Yep. So they're not really that, well, you know, I like things the way they are because I want my buddy to get compensated for it. A key point we got to make to them is that they may get coverage. They're not getting care. <laughs> I, I can kind of reiterate that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like there's a Americans conflate health care with health insurance or health insurance with health care, and they're not the same thing. They're distinctly different. You may have a great Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, like my patient who enrolled today, but he can't get in to see his doctor until Friday. That's not great. He may have great health insurance, but he's not getting great health care. So I think once people realize there's a difference between their, the two, health insurance and health care, you might have more demand for services like this. That's a very good point. That's something that more of us should be educated about on how to take these issues that they're throwing at us. And right now, we've got to educate ourselves. We've got to be the missionaries of all this. And if it's overcomplicated, we're not going to be explaining this to anybody. And by the way, I, I came out of the Tea Party, and it was back in 2009. I actually read the Affordable Care Act then, and I actually presented to my Tea Party on it. That's how I got engaged, and frankly, how I started getting really engaged on politics. So any Tea Party, the best way is to become an informed voter, just to your point on it. This is the way to get plugged in on it. When I found out what was in it, that's kind of lit the fire under me saying, Somebody's got to do something about this.